and he's looking around saying, say, who? No, before the sermon today, uh, I asked uh, Brian Hilger, one of our ministry partners, uh, the headmaster of Hills Academy, to come and say a few words. Brian? Yeah, no, no, not a speaker, but just come and say thank you. Uh, <laughs> that sign knows how to put you on the spot, you know. <laughs> yeah, to bring a message. But I do have a message of thank you. Um, it says in the Bible where God says he'll yeah, open up your storehouse and give you uh, stuff that you don't have room enough to receive. And you guys blessed us greatly with the supplies for the school. And when I say you don't have room enough to store everything, we really don't. And I just want to come and say thank you so much for your continued support, uh, your continued prayers, all the things you guys are doing. Uh, we have about 20 plus, you know, about 20 I know now some more coming, but God is really blessing. You know, we started out last year with about ten students, so we pretty much doubled what we had last year. God is doing awesome things, and uh, it's mainly through our prayer. But when you guys bless us with those things, it just it shows Scripture to be true that He'll give you uh, more than you can have room to receive. And I just want to thank Trinity for everything you guys do for us, uh, every thought. Anything that you do has been a blessing. Uh, there's a lot of people in here who encourage us, and uh, it just gives us the strength to continue. Even on those rough days, you know, this first week was kind of rough. You know, starting school, a lot of things going on, a lot of transitions, and uh, but God has really been faithful. And uh, I really thank Trinity as a partner in ministry that uh, you guys have been so supportive. So continue to pray for us, and we'll continue to pray for you guys. And just thank you so much for your donations. Amen. Thank you, Brian. Brian and Tiffany and all of the Hills Academy team and students are wonderful uh, partners. They participate in helping us maintain the grounds, keeping the upstairs in order. Uh, if you've been upstairs and seen much of the painting, and now we have artwork and all sorts of things, uh, that is a tribute and uh, thanks to Hills Academy for all of that. So uh, the 301 community is thriving here, and we can thank God for that and just pray that she continues. Today is our second sermon in our uh, God's Kingdom in Action series, taking a look at Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Last week was kind of the introduction to the sermon where we look at Jesus' message and Jesus' person, the preacher and his message. We saw that Jesus' message was that God's kingdom has come to earth in the person of Jesus Christ. When Jesus was born, God's reign broke into human history. God's kingdom is not a place even though Matthew refers to the kingdom of heaven, it's not some place we go when we die. The kingdom of heaven, other gospel writers call it the kingdom of God, we talked about that last week, is here. Jesus brought it. It's God reigning as king. Now we know that God's kingdom continues today. So God's kingdom was come. God's kingdom is come in us today. And we know because we still live in a broken world that perfection has not yet achieved, been achieved, so God's kingdom is yet to come. And we saw how God, or Jesus, as God, spoke with authority. Jesus didn't just preach and deliver his message out of some book knowledge that he had, or even based on someone else's experience. Experience and learning through experience, particularly other people's experience, so that we don't repeat their same mistakes. It's a good thing. But Jesus spoke not with human authority, but with divine authority. Because Jesus was and is God. And he was here in human form, again, breaking into human history. We saw that the Sermon on the Mount, while it is probably Jesus' best known teaching, it's also probably his least understood teaching and certainly his least obeyed teaching. 
We saw how many people see the Sermon on the Mount as a set of lofty ideals that maybe will be able to achieve and abide by. Or maybe they're just a restatement or a new law that reminds us of our sinfulness. But as we saw last week, and we're going to see in greater detail today, Jesus was bringing good news of God's kingdom breaking in, and the Sermon on the Mount doesn't set forth lofty ideals or good advice. Jesus' Sermon on the Mount sets forth good news of present reality. How we are to live as kingdom citizens. And we are looking at that today in the passage in Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 through 12, commonly known as the Beatitudes. I asked Melissa today to use a translation that I'm not familiar with particularly, and most of you probably are not. It is a translation. In some ways, a, a looser translation, perhaps even at times, uh, enters into a paraphrase by a professor that I mentioned last week, N.T. Wright, an Anglican bishop uh, who is an expert on the New Testament in particular. But he is one of the people that we talked about last week that is part of this movement to see the Sermon on the Mount as present reality, not some sort of future promise or unattainable idea. And uh, Tom Wright, Professor Wright, is fond of saying that Jesus brought good news, not good advice. When, he, when I first read of him saying that, he was referring to what we call the general gospel. Jesus didn't come saying, believe in me and I'll take you to heaven. Good advice, because you don't want to go to the other place. Jesus came bringing good news of God's kingdom breaking into history and giving us a revolutionary way to live the way God wants us to live and to have some of the blessings that God wants us to have. Specifically, when it comes to what we call the Beatitudes or the blessings, he says the same thing. Jesus isn't bringing good advice, he's bringing good news. And that's why he translates the word frequently translated as blessed or blessed, sometimes as happy. He translates it as wonderful news for. Because Jesus is bringing news of present reality, not some future idea. So to realize that, we first ask the question, who's Jesus talking about? When Jesus says, in the more traditional translation, blessed are, or in our text this morning, welcome news for, who's Jesus talking to? Well, first of all, we know from Matthew chapter 5, the first two verses, he's speaking to his disciples. He has brought his disciples to him. At the end of chapter 4, he has begun to call whom we call the 12 disciples. There is the account Matthew gives us of Simon and his brother Andrew and then John and his brother Andrew being called to Jesus. Jesus says, follow me, and they respond, how? By immediately dropping what they're doing and following Jesus. And then together they go around Galilee, around the community, and Jesus is busy preaching the good news of the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom, not that I come so you can go to heaven, but I come so that you can have heaven on earth. God's kingdom has come. That's the gospel Jesus is preaching, and Jesus is acting on that gospel by healing the sick, by giving sight to the blind, and other supernatural evidences that God is here. And as a result, they've drawn a lot of crowds. So Jesus gets up, goes up the mountains, he draws his disciples to him, and I have the picture of these disciples 
between his closest friends that are in the inner circle, but that some of these other people who are becoming followers of Jesus to be on the outskirts. They're listening in. So Jesus is addressing people who want to know more about Jesus. People who Jesus has called into ministry with him. And Jesus then starts, Welcome news for those of you who are poor in spirit. Why? For the kingdom of God, or Matthew says, the kingdom of heaven is yours. Jesus is speaking not to some group of people that are somehow unique and set apart. Jesus is speaking to members of the kingdom. Jesus is speaking to you and you and you and me, all of us who have believed the good news and seek to be followers of Jesus Christ. You see, those of us who are pure and, or excuse me, who are poor in spirit are those who realize we need Jesus. By ourselves, we are nothing. Remember last week we talked about how God had a perfect plan at creation. God had a plan for perfect communion between himself and all of his creation, starting with human beings and in the rest of creation, yet we as human beings mess that plan up. We rebelled against God. Adam and Eve started it. We continue today. In essence, we want to be God rather than follow God. And that messed up God's plan. And God sent Jesus to break into human history to start fixing what we humans messed up. And Jesus is announcing that everything has changed. It's called the upside down kingdom sometimes for people. Because, for example, later on in verse 5, Jesus says, Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. How many people have been to leadership classes of any sort? How many of you have been in business and had somebody coach you on how to succeed in business? Have you ever heard in any of those classes succeed through being meek? It's usually go get them, be aggressive, go out, stick up for yourself. Now, me, I think, mean, has a negative connotation today. It's not really meant in this verse because it carries uh, connotations of gentleness. Really, probably the best translation of me in this particular text is humble. And in fact, the Greek word for me is also used in the Greek translation of the Old Testament called the Septuagint for poor or for oppressed people, packing back into the poor in spirit. You see, the kingdom of God belongs to those who know they need God. And they are meek and humble and accept that. And they say, oh God, Help me a sinner, just like the tax collector in the temple prayed. That's who God is speaking to, or God through Jesus is speaking to. It's those people who have become kingdom citizens because they know they need God. So Jesus has come not to give good advice to his disciples. He's not saying you should act this way. Jesus is saying you are this way. When you enter the kingdom of God, something changes. We know now, there's a gift of the Holy Spirit, what changes is the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of us. And
and starts changing us, starts transforming us, starts allowing us to live the way God intends us to live. Jesus is bringing wonderful news that you are kingdom citizens and you have all of these traits listed in the attitudes. And better than all of the eight traits, you have all of the eight, actually it's seven, because one is repeated, blessings. They come with it. Lest you're sitting here scratching your head and saying, I'm not yet convinced. Jesus employs a clever and insightful literary device in his delivery. He says, bless or welcome news for the poor in spirit, for they are members of the kingdom of God. As in chapter 3, or verse 3. In verse 10, he closes out his character traits and his blessings by, Blessed are you who are persecuted for pursuing God's way, or for righteousness' sake, as some translations say. Why? For you belong to God's kingdom. In other words, he starts with those who belong to God's kingdom, the poor in spirit, those who know they need God. And then he ends with those who belong in God's kingdom. Why? Because they're persecuted. Because they're seeking God's way. And why are you persecuted for seeking God's way? Because again, it's the upside down kingdom. We are called to be countercultural and to do things different than the rest of the world thinks it's right. And they're not persecuted because of it. Sometimes that's going to become, uh, come in the form of true oppression, physical violence or physical oppression, but frequently it comes simply in the form of ridicule. Back to my humility and meekness example. Don't sit there and try and serve others. You've got to look out for number one, you idiot. Nobody gets anywhere by not doing the very best they can to achieve. You don't get what you want unless you go out and get it. Look out for number one. Pull yourself up by the boot traps. Self-reliance, self-reliance, don't seek help. That's the world's message. God says, seek help, starting with me. And seek help continuing through your brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. And God says, seek, in fact, hunger and thirst for justice. Usually translated righteousness, but I like right translation of that word is justice. You see, both the Hebrew words are almost interchangeable, and the Greek word for justice and righteousness is goes back and forth. But you see, justice fits more kingdom living. Because remember, probably a couple of months ago now, we defined God's justice as what? Seeking positive human relationships. It's more than simply a legal term. It's more than simply getting what one deserves, which is the way we frequently look at justice. But God's justice is acting the way God wants us to act. Seeking positive human relationships. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. And you see, peacemakers in that context, that verse has frequently been used to talk about global and world peace, and that's not an inappropriate objective. But the term really means, and it's applied in the Greek language, to one-on-one -on -one human relationships. Bringing reconciliation and peaceful relations between individuals. Another way of saying, bringing God's justice. 
by facilitating positive human relationships. I've preached on Micah 6a, and during our messages, we frequently refer to Micah 6a, but again, you can hear echoes of Micah 6a throughout these eight verses of wonderful news. Remember Micah 6a? But part of you but to do justice. In other words, justice is an actually do, not a thing you get. Facilitate of your relationships. Do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly or meekly or in poor in spirit with our God. So Jesus is announcing, folks, the prophets, Said what God expects, you struggled with it, and now I, God, am here in the flesh bringing you good news. Hallelujah! God's kingdom's come. Your citizens rejoice and be glad in your citizenship. So, is Jesus? teaching wise things or is Jesus teaching prophetically? We pretty much answered that point. If Jesus was giving wisdom, as many people interpret the Beatitudes to be, he'd simply be saying, you as humans need to seek these ideals and if you do so, good things will happen. That's wisdom teaching putting most of the burden on us. Jesus, however, is teaching prophetically. I've already referenced Micah and some of the other prophets. Jesus is not talking about what we should be working for. Jesus is talking about what has come through God. You see, God's grace enables us to be perfect the way Jesus desires. The perfection that Jesus is talking about for members of God's kingdom isn't based on the disciples' merit. It isn't based on the disciples' activity. It's not based on what I do or what you do or what together we do. It's based on God's grace. It's a free gift already experienced in Jesus when we accepted Jesus as our Savior that's working in us. Good news, not good advice. And so we are called to participate, however, in God's grace. We can earn these blessings. We can earn citizenship in God's kingdom, but we have to participate as kingdom citizens. And use God's gracious gift to spread the good news to others. Next week we'll start looking at how Jesus sees that as happening through us and through his ministry. And then in coming weeks we'll see some nuts and bolts of how Jesus expects us to participate in this gift of God's grace and to fulfill the law rather than replace it. To bring justice God's way to earth. For today, we'll just leave it that we have a part. We don't earn it, we don't deserve it, but God's given us the grace and we have a part to participate. And that then leads us to our celebration. Our joyous participation in God's gracious deliverance. Remember, last week I talked about seven marks of the kingdom that Jesus tends to talk about over and over through his ministry that the prophet Isaiah spoke about when he was talking about the coming Messiah, the coming of God's kingdom. And the first one of that was deliverance or salvation. You see, God's kingdom has come and has delivered us from our oppression, has delivered us from our bondage, has freed us from our sin, freed us from ourselves to live the way God wants us to do. And Jesus is basically saying, if you pardon the real parents, hallelujah, rejoice on it. Be thankful. Because Jesus is announcing the kingdom. And Jesus is announcing that all of us who accept the 
members of the kingdom, they get the blessings of being in God's kingdom. When we mourn, we'll be comforted. We'll be called children of God. We will have our hunger to see things done God's way. And that's more than just a desire. That's a hunger and a thirst bordering on a physical need to see things done God's way. We'll see that coming to pass. If not in our lifetime, certainly at the end of time, in the eschaton. Because remember, God's kingdom has come, God's kingdom is come, and yet God's kingdom will come. And so there always is a future aspect to this, and we shouldn't forget it, but likewise, don't forget the current aspect of it. It's not live as we want to today, or we're going to heaven, because that makes Jesus into some sort of insurance sales. Selling fire insurance. Yes, making sure that we don't burn when we die. You're allowed to laugh. Jesus brings good news of present promises. And then the last thing that Jesus says that I think is important for us today is to realize that it's also cause for celebration when we suffer. Especially when we suffer because of Jesus. But we need to realize also that oppression is not synonymous with opposition. We, kingdom citizens in the United States of America, are opposed on many fronts. And kingdom citizens have been opposed throughout history because we are countercultural. We're different than the rest of the world. Yes, we may be different because we adhere to some set of moral code that you have as far as not committing murder and not committing adultery, not committing sex sins, and not doing all those big things that we see as no, no, no. And I want to belittle that. But God's kingdom isn't about rules. It's about relationship and transformation. We have been persecuted throughout history because we seek to put others first. We seek to do for others and do to others the way we would like to be done for us and to us. And the world says, you are nuts. The world says, don't be merciful, be vengeful. And Jesus is going to talk in specifics about that later on in the Sermon on the Mount. But that's why Christians inevitably face opposition. But understand, opposition is not the same as oppression. In the United States of America, we are blessed to be American citizens protected by the Constitution and able to exercise our religion, able to come and worship the way we want to worship. But with that freedom to practice our religion, we need to make sure we don't just come together and be an inside club. We need to burst out and take the good news to other people. Amen. That's our task. That's our calling. So what I challenge you this week to do is to take seriously Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. Remember I said the kingdom's all about relationship and not rules. Can you relate very well to somebody you don't know closely? Are you able to relate to someone that you don't know what they think and what they expect? Last week, I challenged us to read a chapter a day of Matthew 1 through 7, which gets you the opening context and through the Sermon on the Mount. This week, I'm going to be a little easier. 
I challenge you to each day read Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 20. That covers today's text, last week's text, and next week's text. And as you read it, ask God to talk to you. And as you read through these blessings, these wonderful news for the mourners, for the poor in spirit, for the peacemakers, for those who seek God's way, ask God to give you a message for the day. Maybe there's somebody God wants you to go and make peace with. That you hold a resentment against or maybe that you have hurt in some way or they have perceived you have hurt. And God lays them on your heart. Ask God to give you the willingness to go and say, I'm sorry or I forgive you or I would like to make peace with us. Or maybe God will lay on your heart someone who is mourning the loss of a loved one or the loss of a relationship or the loss of a job. You can be the comforter that Jesus promises by going to them and saying, I love you, I care. That's the challenge is to you. Read these kingdom traits or traits of kingdom citizens and the promises that come with them and ask God to reveal to you for this day how he wants you to act on, to participate in his gracious gift by strength. For you see, God's plan may be messed up, but God's plan will ultimately prevail. God's plan is prevailing. And best of all, God wants us to be a part. Let's say, thank you, Lord. Help me to be a part of bringing your kingdom to Conyers, to Honey Creek, to Rockdale County, Georgia, and the world. Join me. Saving God, we thank you. We thank you for your deliverance, for your gift of freedom from wanting to be God all the time. Yes, we lapse back into it, but through your gift of the Holy Spirit, we can overcome those desires. Through your Holy Spirit, we can live the way you want us to live. Lord, we thank you. Help us to fulfill your purpose as we leave this place to live God's love into our community. That love shone perfectly in the person of Jesus Christ, your Son, in whose name.